So, um, I'm a PhD student in Vienna and I'm also employed at SBA Research. And I did multiple things, uh, including uh, I was founding member of uh, several uh, hacker spaces in Vienna. And uh, um, what I talk, want to talk about today is um, since we had this last talk and we were talking about different authentication methods for iOS, Google, and mobile uh, Windows Phone, and there are so many of these operating systems. So uh, we looked at this at an operating system agnostic way. And which, how can we argument a primary authentication system just with the mobile phone itself? So, um, there are two main uh, uh, spaces in Vienna. One is uh, MetaLab, the other one is HappyLab. Uh, MetaLab is more of the um, living room for nerds style hacker space. Uh, HappyLab is more of the shop uh, style service uh, oriented fab lab space in Vienna. And both come with uh, uh, laboratories where there are all kinds of machinery for people to work on their projects. And so we have like uh, vinyl cutters, uh, which is great for making t-shirts. We have laser cutters where you can cut wood and, and uh, acryl and uh, engrave uh, aluminum and glass and all, all kinds of, of uh, digital production things. Uh, there is an electronics lab also there, uh, and there are, of course, 3D printers. And uh, uh, some of them, uh, some of uh, the, the two spaces have different concepts. Some machines are free, some machines you need to pay for, so there is kind of accounting uh, in the back end. Um, some machines are so heavily uh, demanded that you need a reservation for a certain time slot. But most of the machines are quite fragile and expensive, so you need special training to operate them, and um, you need to follow safety uh, rules. So uh, we had uh, the, the problem that an unsupervised uh, laser cutter caught fire uh, at Happy Lab in Vienna, for example. So um, no usage of these machines without proper introduction, and you need to stay close to the machine. Um, um, so there are different uh, methods in uh, Happy Lab. There are RFID cards to enter the laboratory and also to use the machines. At MetaLab, there are, are eye buttons used for this uh, same purpose. However, of course, people cheat. Uh, people swap cards, people uh, trade machine time. People do not follow safety regulations, leave uh, the machines locked on, maybe by accident, maybe because it's already so late and they need to catch up the last train. Um, things like this happen. So it's not always uh, malicious intent. And of course, people go away maybe just briefly to the toilet uh, uh, while they actually should monitor the machine if, if uh, it's working. Um, as intended. And uh, um, these are the, the kind of, of, uh, of situations where GUI uh, inactiveness does not translate in actual inactivity of the user. Uh, because people need to load or unload, uh, adjust the machine, um, things like this. So, it's not, it's not like you can solve this just with a three minute timer and, and then uh, you lock out the, the people from the machine. So uh, we wanted to somehow improve the system and we're looking at different ways and exploring different things. And uh, it would be nice to somehow not to have another token. Uh, maybe we can use somehow the mobile phone. And uh, mobile phone would have uh, many different advantages. Um, so uh, basically it's, uh, so if we take the, the UDS framework from Bono at all, uh, we can, uh, it, it, um, um, our system would uh, fit into seven 
and half of the eight points that the Bono system um, offers for this kind of authentication systems. It's uh, physically effortless. You, have, you don't need uh, anything to do uh, to get it working. Uh, it's uh, quasi nothing to care. Uh, this means, I mean, a nothing to care system would mean you have no additional artifact, uh, you have no artifact at all. A quasi nothing to care system, uh, which is a, a, an exception in, in, the, in the UDS framework, is no additional artifact you need uh, to care. It's nothing, um, um, it's memory wise, effortless, it scales well, there's no changes regardless how many users are using it. It's easy to learn, it's uh, efficient to use, infrequent errors, uh, all these points. Um, but with uh, mobile phones, including mobile phones, um, we hope they are too personal to share. Or, uh, but on the other hand, um, you need to support a lot of operating systems. There's a, so yes, of course, the two major operating systems have over 90% of market share. But there is a very long tail on, on uh, mobile phone operating systems. And of course, you have uh, a lot of versions to maintain. So can we use the mobile phone somehow in a way to argument uh, the, the system without any additional app, just maybe by its presence? So let's look at a um, modern smartphone. Uh, what kind of transmitters do they come with? So of course, there, are, uh, there is the mobile uh, network transmitter. However, it's quite complicated in the sense that you have, f uh, today you have three different uh, network generations which all work on different uh, frequencies with different modulations. Um, a mobile phone can be attached to multiple cells uh, in your area. And uh, they all use uh, a pseudonym um, a mobile subscriber identity in some form. This means that they're not broadcasting their unique ID over the air. However, they use the TIMSI. And there are a few si ways uh, to de-anonymize the TIMSI, but they do not scale well um, in, in a large environment. So you have to, to listen to the cell and uh, if you know the phone number, you can call them and you can sieve out <coughs> the Timsey that is uh, paged multiple times, things like this. Okay, let's look at the other uh, transmitters. So, yeah, so uh, yeah, for the mobile phones, you will probably end up with half a dozen receivers for all the different standards and, uh, and uh, frequency ranges. And it does not scale well. So the other uh, transceivers you find on a mobile phone. There's RFID and NFC, which have a pretty short range, so you, pro you, you need to be more or less in contact uh, with the machine. Uh, there is Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth uh, has quite a complex discovery protocol. I will come on back on this later. And there is Wi-Fi, um, which also has multiple states you have to care of, but um, they, uh, they, it's offer a quite easy discovery mechanism to see if a device is uh, in vicinity or not. So in the paper, we, we, uh, we compared the different methods and the, the four main points are availability, so how many devices support it, uh, pre prevalence, how many devices usually have this transmitting function enabled or at least use the users use them on a regular basis. Um, it's interesting that there are uh, sometimes different numbers for iPhone and Android users. Uh, we, we also compare the range. We compare how fast you can enumerate or blind scan your vicinity to find all the devices um, and how fast you can make a presence check. So um, just checking if uh, a device, a specific device is present. Oh, sorry, I skipped here. Um, so we found uh, based on, on other studies that 
Bluetooth, for example, is only enabled in about one third of the device uh, by, uh, on a regular basis. However, Wi-Fi uh, is enabled quite often on iPhone users 98% of the time, on Android users 89% of the time. So we took a closer look on Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi, uh, you have to distinguish between if the phone is connected or not connected. And you probably already heard Wi-Fi can be used to track users based on the probe request. Um, th so there are different ways how a Wi-Fi device can find all the access points in vicinity. One is just to listen to all the, the channels are one after each other and to uh, receive probe, uh, not probe, uh, receive uh, beacon frames which advertise all the access points. However, this is, takes quite a long time. So most uh, mobile phone um, manufacturers uh, choose another way which are probe requests. So probe requests is uh, a phone cycling through all the channels um, and sending a probe request on each uh, of the channel and uh, all the access points answered to this probe request. This works much faster than uh, scanning uh, each Wi-Fi channel because uh, these beacon frames are usually only sent uh, 10 times per second and then multiplied with all the channels and, and interference you, it can uh, take quite a long time. So because uh, some people were using this uh, for tracking devices. Uh, uh, Apple started with Mac randomization. This means that uh, during probe requests, it does not use its uh, real Mac address. It uses a randomly generated. However, it has been shown that this scheme is very weak. So on some devices, um, the Mac randomization uh, uses the, the random MAC in the header, but in the option headers, they use the real MAC address. Also, uh, they, use, they just in, keep increasing the sequence number, not resetting it uh, between the different randomization uh, steps. Uh, and also, it's only randomized when the phone is on uh, sleep or when the screen is turned off and it's not connected. However, as soon as you uh, turn on your screen, it uses its uh, real MAC address. And because it's not resetting the sequence number, it's very easy to correlate the random uh, MAC address with the real MAC address. Uh, so this is the disconnected state. On the connect, in the connected state, so uh, a phone is associated with the Wi-Fi, um, most phones still send out probe requests, but are less frequent. Uh, this is because you might get out of range of your currently, ex uh, currently associated uh, access uh, point and then you need to know which other access points are in vicinity and for roaming between access points. Also most phones use a, one of the power, uh, power saving schemes that are available on, on Wi-Fi which basically means they do not, do not listen all the time to the access point but they pull the access point uh, every few seconds. And then there is, of course, if you are associated, you have all the uh, network traffic like broadcasting, app requests, DHCP, uh, your phone is downloading updates, uh, connecting to, your, uh, to one of your, the messages servers uh, that, uh, uh, from, from the apps that you have installed on your phone. So you have constant uh, traffic going on, uh, on and of course you have ARP and ICMP echo and all these things that the phone usually also supports. So, um, if we, uh, so, so this is a table that sums it up uh, for presence and enumeration possibilities on Wi-Fi. Um, uh, in the disconnected state, we, we just passively can sniff probe requests. Uh, in the connected state, we can passively uh, monitor the traffic and just record the MAC addresses that are used and if it should actually happen that within a time frame the phone produces no, um, no traffic whatsoever, then we can still actively probe uh, for the, its existence, for example using ICMP echo, but some devices do not answer on, the, on, uh, on ping requests, but they have to answer on ARP requests or 
uh, IPv6 neighbor solici solicitation requests. They cannot do without this. So this is like a small flowchart, uh, what you have to do, uh, depending on uh, different devices. And if, it sh if we should actually get uh, to a point where we cannot, uh, if you have MAC randomization, but we cannot de-anonymize it, then uh, the simple solution is to ask the people with this phone just to connect to the Wi-Fi. Most users use the Wi-Fi anyway by default and auto-connect to the Wi-Fi because you get much faster data rates and it does not account to your uh, monthly limit. So with all this uh, collecting of Wi-Fi data, there might be a problem because uh, just collecting Wi-Fi data might be considered harmful and Google learned it the hard way uh, with the Google Street uh, View cars that were collecting too much of Wi-Fi and they had quite substantial fines to pay for that and had to de delete all the data. So how can we collect Wi-Fi data uh, in a privacy-preserving manner? Um, well, we came up with a scheme that uh, uses Bloom filters. Um, so we only extract the MAC address and we put them into a Bloom filter. The, the nice thing about uh, Bloom filters is that you can only add things to it uh, and you can test if the Bloom filter has seen uh, the specific pattern before, but you cannot extract the patterns. And uh, they have uh, no false negatives. They might have a small a false positive rate depending on how much you put into it and or how you design it. However, however, since you can only add new patterns but you can never remove patterns, this means that we, yeah, we, need, uh, we need something to expire MAC addresses that we have seen because we want to know if there have been no activity from the phone like in the last three or five minutes. So we should consider that the user has uh, uh, left the, the lab. So uh, we use a ring of bloom filters and we start a new bloom filter every minute, for example. And uh, every time we need to, uh, to uh, we do a present check, we simply check in all of the bloom filters and after five minutes, we discard the oldest one. And uh, here you can also see, uh, we can also, for the active uh, probing requests, uh, we can also ha use the DHCP and ARP lookups. And the nice thing about this scheme is, since we want to uh, implement this in embedded systems, it's constant time and constant space. So, um, uh, for, for the lab, we also need a few administrative procedures like the initial registration. Well, you can find the MAC address on your phone in one of the system menus, but uh, that's uh, not very, con very convenient. Uh, there's a much more convenient way for the initial registration. Just connect to the lab Wi-Fi and visit a personalized URL, maybe uh, given to you with a QR code, and then the system will automatically record your MAC address. Also, you have to consider a phone replacement. People lose phones, replace them by new ones, although uh, these, the, the rate is decreasing. Um, uh, market studies say, however, still phones are replaced. So you can automate the process based on your primary aut authentication scheme um, and maybe have some safeguards if, if someone is using this uh, more than one time in three months, for example, uh, he or she should probably contact the administration. So, um, yeah, conclusion. Um, so, MAC address are not very safe. Um, of course, uh, they are not unspoofable, and maybe if you have, uh, if you root your phone, you probably can fake them. So we are only proposing this uh, as a secondary method, in addition to a strong pri primary authentication. On the plus side, it's very lightweight, it's easy to use, it's uh, almost nothing to carry. It's uh, you get seven and a half points from eight uh, on the Bonon UDS framework. 
it's operating, ag uh, operating system agnostic. You have no need to maintain a large operating system base. And uh, you might combine it with additional uh, features like maybe use it on the entrance as well as a secondary method. But, um, oh, this is the point that I missed at, the, uh, at one of the, on, on the introduction slide. Uh, so uh, the, the system for, uh, uh, the, the Happy Lab system for authentication for running a Fab Lab uh, is mostly on GitHub. And uh, future work would be to include uh, the system into this Fab Lab man uh, project on GitHub. So this is the fast, fast uh, wrap up of the paper. Um, and we'll probably make it on time for, uh, for lunch. But <laughs> questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>